now have the privilege of introducing the winner of this year's Henry and Ann Paolucci Prize for the Conservative Book of the Year. This year's winner is Dr. Daniel J. Mahoney for his book, The Statesman is Thinker, Portraits of Greatness, Courage, and Moderation. Dan's book uh, strikes a perfect theme for the weekend, introducing a new generation to some of the greatest uh, thinkers and statesmen in history, from uh, Cicero to Edmund Burke, Alexis de Tocqueville, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill, Charles de Gaulle, and many more. And it exemplifies how one can combine uh, both thought and action through the virtue of prudence, uh, especially amidst very difficult circumstances. Dan has been involved with ISI for decades. He's taught in the honors program for over 15 years, and he's published three books with ISI, in addition to writing regularly for Modern Age and lecturing on college campuses across the country. He is the professor emeritus at Assumption University, a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute, and a senior writer at Law and Liberty. He received his BA from the College of the Holy Cross and his MA and PhD from Catholic University of America in political science. The winner of last year's prize, Victor Davis Hanson, describes his book as, quote, brilliantly written and research tribute to the pantheon of classically trained and thinking men of action. Dan joins a long list of accomplished honorees, including Victor Davis Hanson, Yuval Levin, Wilfred McClay, Andrew Roberts, Angela Cotavia, and many more. Please join me in welcoming this year's winner, Dan Mahoney. Well, thank you so much, Johnny, for this very gracious words. I, I am going to continue uh, developing a theme that was introduced by Johnny Berker er earlier tonight, and that is the indispensability of gratitude to a truly human life and a truly civilized life. For me, it's a gratifying honor and genuine delight to be awarded the 2023 Pellucci Award for the Conservative Book of the Year. A gratifying honor because I have been committed all my adult life to the essential con conservative tasks of preserving and transmitting, and yes, reforming and renewing the noble civilizational and civic inheritances that help define the West and America. I receive this honor gratefully as a sign that my efforts have borne fruit. To receive this award is also a delight because of my uh, long association, as Johnny had mentioned, with ISI, with the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, one that stretches back somewhere in the 1990s. I think my first summer honors program was in Williamsburg when it was like 103 degrees. I was amazed that people were jogging around Colonial Williamsburg. I did not join them. Uh, and some of my fondest memories and the academia as a whole are associated with ISI. Summer honors programs in Williamsburg, Virginia, Oxford and Cambridge in the UK. That's when the dollar was holding its own. Quebec City to the north, that paragon of political correctness and uh, post-Christianity. Um, and I also remember uh, a whole set of friends who made those experiences so rewarding and delightful. The wisdom and playfulness of the late, great Peter Lawler, who was something of an ISI institution, and of course, working with such friends and editors at ISI as Mark Henry, Jeremy Beer, Jeff Nelson, R.V. Young, and Dan McCarthy. In recent years, I've had the pleasure of participating in the George Washington Statesmanship Program, delivering lectures on Washington and Lincoln, Churchill and de Gaulle and Burke. Um, I'm also pleased to have an article 
on the late Jesuit political theorist James V. Shaw and the brand new issue of Modern Age, there was a man who knew the meaning of both reason and revelation to the very depths of his soul. I've always joked with family and friends that I know all seven good Jesuits in the world. <laughs> there may be 12 or 14, but I know them all, and Father Shaw was among the greatest of them. I'll tell you a quick story about him. Months before he, he died at the age of 91, I I just published a book called The Idol of Our Age, How the Religion of Humanity uh, Subverts Christianity. And I wrote to Father Jim and I said, Father Jim, I need your address at Las Gatos in California to send you my new book. He says, never mind, Dan, I've already reviewed it for the Claremont Review of Books. So there was a 91-year-old Jesuit who was alert right to the, to the very end. And of course, let's not forget all the bright, decent, amiable and energetic students I came across through ISI over the years, and a few, a few that challenged the nerves, uh, but always done, on the whole, the students were just delights and uh, open and hungry for the kind of wisdom that is less and less available on college campuses today. So in a contemporary climate, where education at every level combines deliberate repudiation of our estimable inheritance with ideological tendentiousness that seeks to destroy what remains of it, the work of ISI has become even more necessary. I'm proud to stand with ISI in this noble enterprise. The inheritance we defend is not, of course, good simply because it is old or because it is ours, but it is wisdom tried and true. As a result, it appreciates that we can never begin anew with some revolutionary year zero. That's a reference to the fact that when the French got themselves their first Republican Constitution, the world began anew, year zero, um, uh, the, the 12 months of the year were abolished, seven days of the week were abolished, they got rid of the Sabbath. So when you read the history books, you learn that Robespierre was killed by the convention on the 9th of Thormador in the year two. Well, we never had a year two in America it was still Anno Domini. Of course, Anno Domini doesn't exist anymore. The CE and BCE and all that. But um, it says something about the differences between the two revolutions. The Americans were engaged in a noble experiment to see whether people could govern themselves by reflection and choice rather than an accident by accident of force, as uh, is said at the beginning of Federalist Number 1. But there was never an effort on the part of our founders to reject what we might call the continuity of civilization. In other words, classical and Christian wisdom, the wisdom of the moderate enlightenment, all spoke to the souls and the statesmanship of the American founders. The, the destructive zealots and ideologues among the French revolutionaries did that, displaying deadly contempt for Bur Burke's more capacious understanding of a primordial contract that connects the living, the dead, and the yet to be born. As a tradition dedicated to human liberty, the Western tradition is, of course, dy but dynamic and expansive yet I think with ample room for true pietists, for true piety. As the French political philosopher Bertrand de Juvenel wrote so eloquently in his 1955 classic, Sovereignty and in Inquiry into the Political Good, and I quote, every individual with a spark of imagination 
feels deeply indebted to many others, the living and the dead, the known and the unknown. The wise man knows himself for debtor, and his actions will be inspired by a deep sense of obligation. That is not the spirit, or we, the spirit of self-loathing and repudiation that dominates higher education today is, of course, based on a complete rejection, I think, of that profound insight of Bertrand de Juvenal. Well, reason and experience alike testify that men and women become monsters when they confuse themselves with gods beholden to nothing or no one, the autonomous self. In our times, that conceit has led to utopian dreams and murderous rage or to petty souls who rest content with what Pascal vividly called licking the earth. You can try to figure out what Pascal might mean by that. Uh -huh. Real human freedom and dignity need to be nourished by a deep sense of obligation starting with our forebears, without whom we would not be or have anything at all. Natural piety, however, is not solely focused on the past. It lifts our gaze further outside ourselves to the mysterious givenness of the natural order, and finally is open to the grace that lifts our spirits and allows us to experience the presence of the living God. Only by acknowledging our considerable debts to our forebears, to ennobling tradition, and to the natural and divine sources of our dignity as human beings, are we rendered capable of achieving great and good things in our turn. Now, the last phrase great and good, leads me to the book from which I am being honored tonight, The Statesman as Thinker, Portraits of Greatness, Courage, and Moderation. S somebody asked me um, about another one of the cardinal virtues that was missing there, namely prudence, and I said, well, of course, I, 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 yeah, my whole book is a defense of the politics of prudence, but good titles can't be too long. So we had to uh, uh, leave uh, prudence not forgotten, but uh, out of the title itself. In it, I argue in the book and illustrate with seven or so examples and with ancillary mention of many more that the, tw the twin virtues of magnanimity and moderation. Magnanimity is the Latin for megalosuchia, which is the, the Greek for greatness of soul, something Aristotle talks about in the early books of the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, greatness, greatness of soul and a deeply felt sense of obligation to truth liberty, and conscience. They go hand in hand. In the domain of action, of human action, guided by prudence or practical reason, what towers above and truly endures is the admittedly rare combination of honorable ambition and self-conscious self-limitation where greatness and goodness coexist in a relative harmony, if in some tension. We know, uh, I would say, the, the magnanimity pole is best articulated and defended by the classics, by classical wisdom, and humility, of course, is a quintessential Christian virtue. Th Thomas Aquinas famously says, they only apparently appear to be in contradiction, but... In practice, it's very difficult to combine honorable ambition and a healthy sense of self-restraint. 
But I think all of the figures I highlight in that book, in the book, managed to do that and managed to do it in an impressive and relatively unforced way. Washington was one such exemplar of noble, honorable, and morally serious ambition, which he goped to the service of his fledgling country and to the larger cause of civilized liberty. Across the Atlantic, Napoleon Bonaparte, the Corsican, the short Corsican, famously complained that his contemporaries wanted him to be another Washington, a great man willing to leave the stage and to go home when his duty was done. This he could not do. Uh, the great French writer Chateaubriand said, you know, um, Napoleon did not know how to go home, did not want to go home. That's why he ended up on St. Helena, you know, under British captivity, guarded and not going home, but not, uh, not ruling anyone or anything. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville, who a man I think in his thought combined magnanimity and moderation and political sobriety in a most impressive way, Tocqueville said of Napoleon that he was as great as one could be without being good. So we got a new category there, a kind of deformed greatness by the not so good. Okay. And the without being good was Napoleon's Achilles heel, his fatal flaw. Closer to our day, uh, the French statesman, Charles de Gaulle, said that, or Charles de Gaulle, you know, you feel like an NPR guy when you start pronouncing foreign cities and names, Nicaragua, you know. Uh, uh, closer to our day, Charles de Gaulle said that Napoleon served a severed greatness in moderation, a lesson that should be instructive for future generations. And again, I'm building on de Gaulle's analysis in a couple of his important writings about statesmanship. The great man's works of energy fizzle out or give rise to tragedy when they are severed from what um, de Gaulle called the rules of classical order. And here there's a book by de Gaulle called uh, The Discord Chez L'Enemy, the, the Discord in the and uh, among the enemy, it was translated in English as the enemy's house divide in a little play on, on Lincoln. But it's a work that, it was a more civilized world. You know, de Gaulle was a prisoner of war. He was captured in 1916. He was an officer, so he had access to a German prison library. And he started to write a book about why Germany lost World War I. And he blamed it in part on the insubordination of German military elites and especially the influence of Nietzsche on them, of, uh, of will to power, of contempt for moderation, for the rules of ca classical order. So what did they forget? De Gaulle said, from an appreciation of, quote, the limits marked out by human experience, common sense, and the law, unquote, truly magnanimous statesmen learn and I quote De Gaulle again, 34 years of age in 1924, the sense of balance, of what is possible, of measure, which alone renders the works of energy durable and fruitful. The Germans had plenty of ambition and energy, but they lacked measure and a sense of moderation and restraint. Writing in 1924, de Gaulle already saw the severing of greatness and measure at work in the Nietzscheanized military and political elites of Wilhelmine, Germany. How much worse, however, was the contempt for decency, moderation, and the moral law that informed Hitler's monstrous revolution of nihilism? Communism, too, warred unrelentingly against all the human goods, all the precious achievements of civilization, against truth, 
against human liberty and dignity, against the very idea of natural right. There's a wonderful little discussion near the end of part two of the Communist Manifesto when Marx says, I refuse to take seriously any objections raised by to communism in the name of philosophy, religion, or natural justice. You know, those are just the class pretensions of the enemy of the people. Well, uh, um, as we conservatives well know, the Nazi and communist efforts to impose what the great political philosopher Eric Vogelin memorably called mendacious second realities on the only human condition we know gave rise to forms of murderous tyranny hitherto unimaginable. Now, how very sad, but how instructive it is that progressives everywhere, and far, far too many among the young, still believe that communism is good in theory and far from terrible in practice. And I can tell you that that belief that somehow communism is on the side of the angels or at, uh, I think it was uh, Harry Hopkins, FDR's right-hand man who called the Soviet Union the New Deal in a hurry. You know, uh, you know, remember Mussolini making the trains run on time. Well, um, many young people think communism is superior in aspiration to the quotidian realities of liberal and constitutional orders. And nothing they're hearing in their universities suggests otherwise. As a country and as a civilization, we have thus failed miserably in passing on the lessons of the 20th century to new generations. Chief among them, the great truth that ideological Manichaeanism, the rooting of evil, all evil in suspect groups, the Jews, the kulaks, the industrious peasants, religious believers, the bourgeoisie, assorted class enemies, perhaps, perhaps young white men today, rather than in a flawed human heart. Well, this Manichaeanism is an invitation, nay, a sure route to hell on earth. Today, nearly 25 years or so, after the Annus Mirabilis of 1989, we are observing a repetition in new form of the ideological lie. Progressives willfully see in imperfect but largely decent societies nothing but evil, injustice, and exploitation. Critical race theory and wokeness have replaced gratitude to our forebears and democratic self-respect. And new groups of people, alleged oppressors, are called to loathe themselves or to be banished from the civic and human community. Such unrelieved contempt for our fellow citizens has nothing to do with justice, social, or otherwise. Quite the contrary. It makes a mockery of the shared bonds that make free civic life possible, and it creates a fictive world of permanent victims and oppressors. It is light years away from the affirmation of common humanity and common citizenship. So much for the moral realism the liberating moral realism that affirms in Solzhenitsyn's famous words from the Gulag Archipelago, and I quote, that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts, quote unquote. Faced with human nature in extremis in the Soviet Gulag, Solzhenitsyn rediscovered a truth central to classical and biblical wisdom, and I think broadly held uh, and expressed in the sober 
moral and political wisdom of our founding fathers. It is impossible, again, I'm quoting Solzhenitsyn, to expel evil from the world in its entirety, but it is possible to constrict it within each person. To acknowledge this is to begin to find wisdom and self-knowledge. In contrast, the woke, the coercive moral and political fanat- uh, coercive moral and political fanatics to the core, renew the ideological lie of the 20th century, common to both right and left-wing totalitarianism, in the name of fighting racial, ethnic, and sexual injustice. But they end up tyrannizing the soul, polluting the public. St- base with insidious cliches because they do not begin to understand the moral drama that animates each and every human soul. Getting a little bit of the feel of my next book with Encounter, which is called The Persistence of the Ideological Lie. They only know how to negate and repudiate, to destroy the precious and fragile inheritance that has been passed on to us for our safekeeping. To do this, we need new statesmen to arise, to be cultivated among us. And pending that, each of us needs to have some tincture of the statesman in him or her. People often ask me how we can renew the noble tradition of statesmanship, represented by Solon and Cicero in antiquity, and by the the likes of Burke, Washington, Lincoln, Churchill, De Gaulle, and Václav Havel closer to home. The first thing, of course, the first thing to do, of course, is to study them and know who they are. You know, Waters World, you see Jefferson, and he's, you know, nine out of ten New Yorkers can't tell you who he is. We all know. That's a, uh, (laughs) that's part of reality, too. As it happens, this is what the founders did. Cicero's On Duties, a great work of moral and political philosophy, is a truly estimable work that shaped the moral and political imagination of the West well into the 19th century. As I describe in my book, Cicero's honorable statesman is equally distant from the manipulations of the Machiavellian prince and the Nietzschean overman or superman, contemptuous as they are of traditional moral wisdom and an ethic of self-restraint and honorable ambition, but also from the aversion to the legitimate tough-minded exercise of authority by the contemporary humanitarian. Charles Peggy, the great French Catholic poet and philosopher, once said about Kantians, you know, with everything's moral duty, he said, the Kantians uh, don't want us to have clean hands. They don't want us to have any hands at all. You know, statesmen need hands. They have to make tough decisions. But that's not the same thing as adopting the power ethic of of Machiavelli or Nietzsche. Uh, Neither hard nor soft in his moral bearing, the true statesman takes his bearing from what Cicero called in Latin, the honestum, the fine, the noble, the honorable, at the service of civilized liberty. Liberty and its moral preconditions and purposes are the statesman's lodestars. And those preconditions and purposes include authoritative institution, an army that trains men dedicated to honor and not to self-expression, uh, for example, or social engineering. This is the realistic yet high-minded framework of thought and action that our theorists of repudiation so mindlessly aim to bury. Instead of legitimate authority and of decent norms that serve a community of citizens, they see everywhere only implacable power, crude, oppressive, self-serving, and now, of course, predictably racist to the core. These secular priests see only domination, where others rightly discern love, consent, 
community, and the bonds of affection, civic and familial. I was at a conference two days ago with the Heritage Foundation honoring the late, great Midge Dector and rereading her memoirs. I was brought back in time to a prominent and influential feminist from the 70s, Susan Brown Miller, whose great insight was all sexual uh, uh, congress between men and women is a form of rape. You know, well, you, know, you can build something really great on that uh, encouraging insight. Uh, the heresy of domination, as Roger Scruton calls it, takes a partial truth, the insight that authority, which is a very real thing, can become authoritarian and domineering and, turned, and turns it into a fanatical and nihilistic obfuscation. The refusal to accept, and here I quote Scruton, that power is sometimes, at least, benign and decent, like the power of a loving parent conferred by the object of love. Or think of a statesman who really is moved by a love of his country. And the partisans of this heresy, because they reduce everything to power and power struggle, govern those social and cultural institutions. They have come to commandeer, and commandeer is the right word, like the universities and media, in the very manner they contend, because they can't imagine another way of human beings relating to each other. I'm near the end. As I argue in the closing pages of my book, our task is to reaffirm the real in a spirit of gratitude for what has been passed on by our forebears as a precious gift. And I believe Johnny Burke quoted the next words, only by repudiating repudiation do we have a fighting chance of again seeing the likes of the great statesman thinkers I describe in my book. But that act of moral recovery and civilizational renewal will demand of us an exercise of grandeur, of greatness and moderation that will test our mettle as free and civilized men and women. True moderation, true moderation is not just accommodating things as they drift in an ever more thoughtless and aggressively repudiational direction. True moderation will demand rare courage and not tepid passivity before the forces of self-loathing, negation, and repudiation. At ISI events, we like to quote Burke. So here I go. That is the false reptile courage that Edmund Burke saw at work among the English Whigs like Charles Fox, who wanted to make their peace with Jacobinism. To cite the last sentence of my book, the choice is ours. There is no reason to despair because free will is a gift from on high. We are always free to act. We are always free not to live by lies. It is up to us to exercise free will prudently, justly, courageously, that is, wisely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahoney, for those insightful remarks. They were trivial. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, ISI board member Will Long, who has a couple of words to share with you all this evening. Uh, Will Long is a Harvard grad, the founder and CEO of Numenar Analytics, co-founder of the ISI alumni group, the Cicero Debate Society, and of course, ISI board member. Come on up, Will. Thank you, Claire. Um, well, I'm sure like many of you, I attended uh, many ISI events during my college years. And uh, although 17 may be too many, uh, but I've been a huge beneficiary um, of ISI uh, since the day that 
uh, as a sophomore at Harvard studying computer science, Tyler Dobbs uh, found me and uh, insisted that I go to something called the Intercollegiate Studies Institute Summer Honors Program, which I was not really inclined to do, but uh, he was so persistent that uh, eventually in the summer of 2016, um, I found myself uh, at ISI Summer Honors and the rest is, as they say, uh, history. Over the next couple of years, ISI is where I uh, discovered, learned a love of the liberal arts and the great conversation. It's where I made some of my best friends and groomsmen, including many of the people in this room here tonight. It's where I decided to start my business. It's where I discovered my faith. It's more, most importantly, um, where I received the moral and intellectual formation that Harvard couldn't or wouldn't uh, give me. So I really feel that a, a good part of my personal and professional identity is really thanks uh, to ISI. And I don't know, I'm sure many of you feel the same way, um, and I'm not sure how you repay a debt like that, but I'm sure money doesn't hurt. Of course, the thing is, um, of course, when we were students, I distinctly remember, and I'm curious if any of my fellow ISI alum, if this resonates with you, I remember showing up at uh, your first regional conference and just thinking, wow, what a, what a beautiful venue. I can't believe someone paid for a plane ticket, uh, two hotel nights, and three meals a day for me to come here and talk about political philosophy. Uh, I wonder how much that cost ISI. Um, and one day, I'm sure I'll pay it back myself. Then as a young professional, life happens. Uh, work is crazy. Uh, you've got brunch on the weekends. Uh, you know, and what, with what spare time you have, you're trying to resuscitate your dating life. And before you know it, uh, you don't start donating back to ISI until after they make you a trustee. So what I'm trying to say is, um, don't be like me. Don't wait that long. This is the time for us to do what we resolve to do um, and give back to the institution that has given so much to us. I hope that uh, everyone here will consider uh, donating to ISI so that they can continue the good work of changing the lives of the next generation. Thank you so much.